Hello everybody. Welcome to a special program that the Hardwick Gazette and HCTV are jointly doing to bring you interviews of the candidates in Vermont's primary election. The primary this year is August 13th. We'll be interviewing all the candidates in four Senate districts and five House districts that the 11 towns of the Hardwick Gazette are uh, represented by. So, You'll be able to watch these at hctv.us or read them at hardwickgazette.org and each uh, place will be linked to the other. So we'll bring you now interviews of your local candidates. Thanks for watching. Well, you know, first I'd say that, you know, it's a lifetime commitment for me. I've been um, in my local community my whole life and been um, very involved in my community my whole life. Um, I have um, over 40 years of service within the legislature and particularly at this juncture in time with so many retirements in the state senate um, and um, having lost some of the members that have the most experience i now have um, a length of experience in the senate that is quite long and particularly in a place like the appropriations committee i have a lot of um, background there and I think it's going to be important in a place where we've had as much turnover as we have. Well, I, I would first start with an example within um, um, Lamoille County. Um, the community of Morseville voted on school budgets three times this year, had a terrible time passing the budget. Um, Morseville spends per student 16% less than the state average. Um, their test scores are well above the state average in the performance of their students. Within the education funding formula, we um, presently, went to reach 115 and 118% above um, um, the per pupil average, um, we penalize communities um, through the tax structure to do that. I look at communities like Morseville, who've struggled to produce a good product where their test scores are good, and spending 16% less per student, and I um, don't understand why, if we can penalize communities on the, um, on the high side and the high spending, why we shouldn't say to communities that do everything we ask them, give them a carrot, give them some opportunity to have it reflected within their tax rate that they have good test scores and, um, and their spending is lower. And I think we have to be aware of that. We, this year, within the legislative process, raise taxes on um, um, short-term rentals. Um, and we raised um, um, uh, put the cloud tax in place, and we put over $50 million in, um, in general fund um, surplus in, and we're going to have to make that up next year, so we're probably facing the same thing next year. So we ought to reward communities that are lower. Well, I think um, our young people can't afford homes. Um, I think the commitment we've made to um, VHCB and uh, housing authorities in the state, we've significantly increased their funding the past few years over COVID. A lot of that money will roll through the system to help get projects started um, through groups like Lamoille Housing Partnership in that. Um, we need to keep up the effort in that area. We also need to talk about um, the permit process, and I don't just mean when they say Act 250, um, it can take 
once you apply for, say, for example, a wetlands permit, it can take up to five months to hear back from the agency about the permit that has been offered. That's a long time. And in the communities of Johnson and Cambridge, they got flooded, and we're now approaching the loss of 40 housing units and no major projects going up in those communities. We need to make sure we have streamlined permit processes and we, um, and through um, Lamoille Housing Partnership and groups like that, continue their support. Well, I think we're lost in the middle of all of um, um, this homeless debate. We've lowered the amount of um, homeless people to um, a much smaller group than it was. And what the, I think clearly, the hotel and motel program um, that we offered um, during COVID and now we're trying to keep alive is not the best way to um, take care of people. A majority of the people that are left, and it's the vast majority, have mental health um, um, concerns, they have addiction concerns, and if we can't match what we're doing um, to house people with the programs to address their underlying programs long term, um, we're going to fail. And there's too many people, in my view, that are just concerned about getting somebody a room and, and whether it be in a motel. It has to be matched with something and there has to be something straight through if we're going to be successful dealing with homeless. Wow, you, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> you kind of cover all of the infrastructure um, things in one. I will say with electric vehicles, I think we took an important step um, by putting a surcharge on registrations this year, albeit nowhere near what, um, because the transportation system has always been a system that was user-based. We put something on so they do feel a charge now. And that charge is directed directly at um, electric vehicles and the charging stations that they need around the state. Quite frankly, when you get away from the interstates and major um, 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 routes, um, it's hard to get your vehicle charged. So I think by instituting that, we're working on changing a mindset to bring back the thought, the underlying thing in transportation, that it's, um, it should be a system whereby user pays. Um, and so that's the transportation piece of what you ask, and I'm not sure that I really have enough time to go in depth into all of the other pieces that you, you brought. It's $82, I think, they added on, on, on the registration. I think the figures that um, they came up with, that it's between two and $300, that, that by going electric vehicles, they avoid um, um, the tax. So at 82, it's significantly less, but it brings back the, the idea that you do have to have um, a, a user system and do that. And you can't do anything to help the towns without revenue. Um, the, town, the problem for the towns is everything that goes back to help them, um, if it's, unless it's a bridge over 20 feet, doesn't get a federal match. Um, I really think in Vermont, uh, state government with the passage of the constitutional amendment that passed last time, um, that Vermont um, really dealt with that issue and settled that issue. Um, the constitutional amendment that was passed by the public here, passed by the legislature in two different bienniums and passed by um, the voters of this state, um, 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 settled that question here. I think the most important thing really is overall affordability for young families to stay here. Um, we are in a place where it's more and more difficult for young people to be successful here. Just to give you an example, um, 
we have about 17,000 less people working in Vermont um, on a daily basis than we did 15 years ago. And where that comes in and affects us, it affects us all in n um, numerous ways. Um, for state revenues, you've got less people paying income taxes. So as we reach a point where 25% of the state now is over 65 and needs, and older people need more services, it affects us in the state budget. But it's also not healthy for the place that our young families can't get started here. 